let's clap our hands for Jesus in this house. Anybody grateful for the love of God? Stop somebody high five and tell them I'm getting better. Grab your seats, grab your seats. We're so glad that you're here today. We want to welcome everybody watching online. And let's clap our hands for our Lafayette campus, everybody. Show your love. Yeah, this is our last weekend in Lafayette. We're moving the Lafayette campus to Pleasant Hill. A church door opened for us to rent a church out there. And so we're really grateful. Next week is the first weekend in the new facility. Y'all should go check it out, especially if you live over there. And uh, super excited about what God's doing. He gave us two words a long time ago. And if you know those words, can you shout them out at the top of your lungs? Come on, everybody. Hope and healing. Hope for you tomorrow and healing from your... It's all found in Jesus. So grab your notes out, grab your pens. We're going to laugh a little bit. We're going to learn a little bit. And I'm going to stretch our faith with the Word of God today as we are in a series called Legacy. Somebody shout Legacy. Legacy. Come on, shout Legacy like you're glad to be here. Legacy. Legacy is where you're living your life beyond you. You're living your life to leave a mark on the earth for heaven. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, by a show of hands, both campuses, how many of you have a scar on your person, your body somewhere, from a bad decision you made a long time ago? Come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, I got a scar on my hand, and, and uh, we should compare scars. That'd be, well, that's weird. Don't do that. How many have ever had somebody come over your house, and they let, like, like, like they scratched a wall, or they broke something, chipped something, and left a mark in your house? Anybody, anybody? Don't look around. Yeah, somebody like, it's in right here. I'm convinced that all of us, in the deepest recesses of our heart, we long to make a mark on the earth for heaven. Today, I want to help you with this because I believe every person on planet earth are asking at least three questions, either directly or indirectly, every single day. And that is this. First of all, what's my purpose? <laughs> Many people don't even know what their purpose is. They live and die, never find purpose. Secondly, does my life matter? They don't know that God has value for their life, and so they don't feel value for other people's lives. They are asking the question, does my life even matter? Here's the third question I believe we're all asking, and that is, will I ever do anything significant? Every one of us wants to do something big. We want to do something significant. We want to be remembered for something good. And what many people don't realize is that all of those answers are found in Jesus Christ. Listen, God has purpose for you. Can I hear an amen? Your life is valuable, and the only place that you're going to find something significant is found in Jesus Christ. Come on, clap your hands one more time for legacy, for Jesus. Okay, listen. One of the main issues of our generation is their top desire is they want to be famous. But what they forget is that fame does not bring significance. A lot of people think if I could just get more followers on Instagram, or if I could just become famous, I'll find significance. But we can all agree there are a lot of famous people who hate themselves. Amen. It's not about becoming famous. It's about becoming significant in the purpose and the will of God. So I want to help you with this today. We do four things at our church, and we only do four things. We want to help you know God, like personally, like for real. Not that you just know about him, but you really know him. And how we do this is our weekend Sunday and Saturday services. We want to help you Provide an opportunity for people to come to know God. It's an introduction to God. And so you bring your friends, you bring your family members, and we'll help you help them know God. Secondly, you need a place where you can find some freedom, like get, get free from some issues. Because how many know y'all have some issues? Our pastor puts it this way. If you don't think you have an issue, that is your issue. We all have them, and we need a place that we can deal with them, where we can be honest and take off the mask. There's no greater place to do that than in a small group setting. So we have small groups that gather, and on your chair today, there is a small group card to lead a small group in February, and we just finished our, our semester in fall. Man, we had like 300 small groups. I'm so pumped for the lives that were changed and the hope that was received through the small group leaders. We ought to clap our hands and th th say thank God for the small group leaders. And then we had a, we had a freedom conference this, this last weekend where this place was packed out with people who, gone, who had gone through a freedom small group and got a freedom conference. The only way you can get a freedom conference is if you go through the freedom small group. So starting in February, there's another one coming in May. And then we want you to discover your purpose. Because again, a lot of people live and die and never find 
what their purpose is. So if you don't have purpose, you won't live purposefully. You will just kind of live like whatever. So we want to help you with that. And it's in our growth track. You need to pick four weekends. You owe it to yourself. Pick four weekends. Go through growth track. And we'll help you discover what makes you unique. So that you can do the fourth thing. And that's the ultimate thing. Make a difference. You make a difference on the dream team. The dream team's filled with regular people. They're not perfect. We all got issues. But the most connected people in any church are those serving and in small groups. You want to be more connected? Get in a small group and start to serve. And you watch as your life comes alive. Okay, watch this. Watch this. We want you not volunteering in places of drudgery. If you hate kids, we don't want you in the nursery. <laughs> I'm here like, I'll work in the nursery, but give me some duct tape and NyQuil. No, don't, that's wrong. <laughs> if you hate people and you're mean, we're not going to be putting you at the front door, greeting people <laughs> with our sign. You know, Sunday's fun day. You'd be like. <laughs> Put you in IT. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We will find a spot. But in, when you do what you're created to do, you don't burn out. It energizes you. Because you're connecting to the purpose of God, and you're connecting that to making a difference for eternity. Is this making sense? Say yes. Yeah. So these are the four things we do. And this last one, the fourth one, making a difference, I want to help you find out what that is. Because your life matters, and your life will never make sense. It'll never feel significant until you're giving your life away to make a difference in somebody else's life. And so what makes today so wonderful is that we're going to talk a little bit about what we have done, and we're going to talk about what we could do. So Legacy Offering Weekend is this. We're, we've been praying for weeks now. It's not springing it on you. It's praying, planning, preparing, so we can give this offering away to these five lanes that I'm about to tell you where it's going. Number one, we give to local missions. We give locally. Next weekend, this, this lobby is going to be filled with five hundred kids that are getting Christmas presents who otherwise many of them would not have Christmas presents. That's because of your generosity. Kids come in one place, parents go to another, and I wish we could do it for everybody. It, we've already invited the people. It's invite only, so we can't just have people show up. There won't be enough, but here's what we do. We invite the families. Parents go shopping for their kids. They get a big gift, a medium gift, a small gift, and a Bible, and we tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. How many think that's a good idea? Like, our first priority is to this area. We're called to this area, the Bay Area, and this is our first priority. And there are some seasons in the year that we have to recognize are the most valuable or the highest return on investment for serving the community. Okay, we're, we're in that right now. The next two weekends are crucial. Okay, okay, pay attention, everybody. Turn your hearing aid up. I want you to understand that the next two weeks are vitally important to reaching more people. Next weekend, we have At The Movies, one week only. It's where we take modern day stories and use them to communicate biblical truth. You say, you're gonna watch a movie in church? We're using clips from there. I'm still preaching, Jesus is the only way. And by the way, uh, there's gonna be popcorn soda and, 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 and. Jesus was the greatest teacher the world's ever known. How did he teach? He took modern day stories and used them to communicate biblical truth. We're doing the same thing. But, 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 but. Turn, turn and tell somebody. But, 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 but. <laughs> if this is your church, okay, look, 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 look. At the movies next week, it's not for you. Come on. Smile at me. <laughs> it's for your friends. Your friends will say yes to a church invitation over the next two weeks. I don't know why. For some reason during Christmas, people just say yes to come to church. 80% of people that said they, they said they would come to church if they were just personally invited by somebody they knew. Tell them to come, and we'll present the gospel in story form. And then we have 12 Christmas services the next weekend. Guys, I'm so fired up. I don't know what to do. We have services here that begin on the 21st. And then we have a Pleasant Hill location, our brand new location there. You're going to want to go check that out. We take Monday off, and we do a few more services, both locations, uh, candlelight services. So you tell your friends, hey, guys, we're going to do candlelight. Turn the lights off. Turn the light a candle. Say, oh, so. <laughs> we're light the candle, pass it, and the whole place illuminates with, oh, it's the best. You got to get your friends here. You need to feel the thrill of having an unchurched person sitting right next to you in one of these services. 
and it will be the service you care about the most. Like, you'll be, your heart will be pounding a little bit. Like, oh, Sean, don't mess this up. You better sing these songs. You better be funny today. My friend's here. I'm not playing around. And when I give that a little opportunity at the end, hey, guys, close your eyes and bow your heads. I'm going to lead you to the Lord. If, if, you, if you brought a friend, I give you permission to peek. Come on, you're doing it already, aren't you? Acting like your eyes are closed. Mm, but I'm looking through my eyelashes. I got a lot of mascara on, but I can't really see. It's all foggy. When you have a friend raise their hand, that will be the favorite service of your life. Not because you remember what I preach, you'll forget it. Not because they sang your favorite songs, it won't matter. It will be because you finally realize what this church is all about. Re reaching those people who are far from God, bringing them close to receive hope and healing in Jesus Christ. Are y'all with me? Okay, here's what I need you to do. Go to our website today and register. Get your free ticket for Christmas. Why we got to get a ticket to come to church? Because we have so many people. We don't want 10,000 people coming to one service, all right? So help us out. They're free tickets. They give you priority seating. It doesn't save your seat. So don't come into church, candlelight service, 13 minutes late, like, where's my seat? No, it, we gave it away. It's priority seating. It'll get you in a little earlier so you can pick a good seat. But then 10 minutes before service, we give them all away. But help us, help us. Go to the website today. Will y'all help me out? Yep. Thank you. Three of you. That's great. I'm a great motivator. <laughs> Come on. Will y'all help me out? Yeah. Help our team out. It, it, this, this disperses the, the, the crowd in 12 services as opposed to just, you know, a couple that are just ridiculously packed. And here's what happens. When it's packed, guests leave. They, they can't find a parking spot. They'll leave. We don't want that. We have 12 services to bring our friends to. And let's make the most of this. Your best chance of getting a yes all year long, the next two weeks. So take these invite cards, pass them out everywhere you go, and let's make the biggest difference possible. Amen. Y'all with me so far? Okay, that's just what's happening. Then we have 21 days of prayer, January 4th through the 25th, and uh, we're going to have Monday morning prayer through Friday morning prayer, 6 a.m. Look at me. Some of y'all ain't never seen 6 a.m. But we're going to be praying for an hour every day as we pray, as we fast, saying, God, bless this new year. Now, for local missions, here's what I mean by that. You've already fed over 1,600 people for Thanksgiving. Way to go. We're now vetting other ministries. We're giving what comes in today. We're going to be playing Santa Claus and driving to some of these other organizations, other churches, other missions, er missionary areas, and shelters, and food pantries, and women's battered homes. And we show up with a check. It's a fat check. And we say, God bless you from your fellowship church cousins. We love you. Have a great Christmas. That you should see their face. Matter of fact, we'll play you the video next week. It'll be so fun. We'll, we'll show you what you did this week just locally. And then on top of that, uh, we do national missions. So local missions is one lane. Here's another lane where the money's going to. National missions. Can you ready for this? Um, in ARC, the, I sit on the board. It's the Association of Related Churches. You have helped plant 876 churches in America. Oh, y'all need to clap and really give God praise for this. 67 churches just this year. 67 new cities have new churches because of your generosity. Get this. On opening Sunday weekend alone, 18,945 people showed up to these churches just this year. Just this year, 826 people gave their life to Jesus just on opening weekend. Come on, clap your hands and really say a good amen. That's our national strategy is this. Like, I think America needs some Jesus. Because politics isn't fixing it. And I don't think it ever will. I think what fixes America is planning more life-giving churches to be the gift of God to that city. Come on, if you believe that, say a good amen. amen. So, you've given to start 876 churches, 67 this year. We've given to Royal Kids Camp, which is a foster care program just to help kids have gifts. And we tell them, Jesus loves you, no strings attached. You've helped with the floods in Florida. You've helped with the floods in Houston. You've helped with the hurricane in the Bahamas. And you've helped with the Dream Center, which they took a hospital, everybody, and turned it into the biggest recovery home in America. You've helped with that already. We're also helping with One Day LA. What's that? It's the largest mission trip in the nation to our own 
country in Los Angeles next year, July. We're heading down there, and we're going to be a part of the biggest outreach. I believe 20,000 folks are showing up to take over Los Angeles. You want to go? Yeah. All right, there's a meeting today at 2.30, and we're going to give you all the information. It's cheaper than our previous mission trip to Peru and to uh, uh, Nicaragua and these other places, but we want to help you make the biggest difference possible. All right, so we want to start churches, but we also want to resource existing ones. So there's a, there's a lot of churches that are struggling. So last month, we had FC24, and we had 250 pastors fly in from all around the nation and from outside of the country so we can train them and give them the resources that they need to grow. These guys were so excited. They're crying, saying, this is a game changer. Thank you so much. Guess what? Some of the churches that needed it the most couldn't afford to come, so we paid for them to come. We support their flights and hotel because we believe in the local church, not just here in the Bay Area, but around the big C, capital C church. Amen, everybody. And then we're taking five pastors, and, and they planted this year, and we're going we're gonna to take care of Christmas gifts for their kids. Because I remember when we started this church, I was 24, had four girls under the age of two, and we were struggling because we dumped our life savings in to start this church. Man, if anybody would have came by and helped us out that year, I would have been forever grateful. We're going to take care of some pastors and their kids. Just let them know. Thank you for your sacrifice. Not everybody will say yes to the call of God, but you did. So we will back you and support you. Here's Christmas on us. Amen. International missions, local missions, national missions, international missions. This is a big one because a lot of times it's out of sight, out of mind. But it can't be because, because the Bible says, for God so loved the, the whole world. If you love God, you got to love what he loves. And that's all people. So our giving has made a difference here in Africa, Asia, South America, and really um, all around the globe. Like, for instance, we've given to A21, which is an anti-human trafficking organization with Nick and Christine Kane. You have helped reach a thousand people rescued out of sex trafficking. Can we give God praise? A thousand people. Most of the, the emissions dollar that comes from America and goes over to other countries is 97% is already going to already reach people groups. But there's a 3% window, 3% of the population that has never heard the gospel. We're focusing on that this year. We're focusing because we know some people who are doing a great job of telling them about the love of Jesus Christ in other countries. We've given to Peru One Child Matters, which is a, a helping feed kids overseas, and then One Hope, which, by the way, you have helped get the Bible to 1.6 billion kids. I said billion with the B. They have the Bible in their, their own language. Uh, 1.6 billion kids. We're giving 1% um, to, to King of Kings Church in Jerusalem every month. Convoy of Hope, which they help out with disaster relief, and then they attach the name of Jesus to it. World Vision, Kingdom Builders, anti-sex trafficking. You are making a huge difference, and we can do more in international missions. Here's the fourth lane, Fellowship Church Expansion. We believe that we want to accelerate the vision of Fellowship Church. Some of you are like, does it need acceleration? <laughs> no, we're going pretty fast. Yes, God's given us more opportunity. God's given us more windows of opportunity, more influence. And as the Lord opens up doors, we will keep stepping through them. He's got enough to open up the right door and close the wrong ones. Amen? Amen. But I believe that God wants us to bless our cities around the Bay Area. We could step back and say, hey, we're good. God's done a lot. But there's 101 cities in the Bay Area. How many of them have hurting and broken people? Talk back to the preacher. 101. How many of them need a life-giving church? Come on, everybody. I'm praying that you pray with me. Help me look for cities and buildings that we can buy and rent and lease to have other churches. You need to come with me on this journey that we're not a church in one location. God's changing our mindset to be a multi-site church to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Since we moved in here, the church grew by 3,000 people. Sean, is it just about the numbers? Yes, because every number represents a soul. Every soul has a story and a name that Jesus is passionately in love with. Come on, everybody. We've got to reach more. We've got to be compelled to reach more people. Like, look around. 
God's blessed us with a lot, but with this comes great responsibility. And I, be, I don't want that blessing to stop. So we keep giving it away. We keep blessing others. And we need to know that God's heart is for more. And then our fifth lane is our Bible college. Our Bible college is three years old, and it's growing at a fast rate. And I, my prayer is this, that we would get to a place where we could scholarship some kids so they didn't have to work a part-time job. They can focus it all on ministry because they're saying yes to the call of God, so we might as well support them. If you give today, this is what the money's going to. 100% is going to these five lanes, and I believe we're going to make a, di a difference in the world. Now, let me say this. The, the invite cards are great to pass out, but we have something called kindness cards in the lobby, too. They just say, God loves you, no strings attached. Great. But can I just ask you, I know you're already doing this, do something kind for somebody, accelerate it this week and next week, buy somebody's coffee and give them a card, because you never know who's one invitation away. My wife and I were eating ramen this week at a restaurant, and two people came and sat right by us, like right by us. And we sparked a, a conversation up, and we start talking and having a good time. At the end, I bought their meal. But then I gave them a church invite card, and I said, hey, I don't know what you're doing for Christmas. We have 12 Christmas candlelights, sir. Bring the whole family. I turned around and walked away. Okay, watch this. If I just would have given them a card, they probably wouldn't have listened. But when I said, I bought your meal, they were like, ooh. Okay. Listen, many times, many times, the Bible says this. If you give a cup of cold water in my name, I'll remember it. Many people are giving the cup of cold water, but no name. They're doing nice things, but not attaching the name of Jesus to it. Watch this. There's another group of people. They're giving the name, but they're not doing anything nice. We have to give the cup of cold water with the name. And Jesus said, I'll remember that. Okay, listen, if they never come to church, okay. But what if they do? What if they come to church this Christmas and their lives are changed? What if they experience the grace of God for the first time? What if they give their life to Jesus and generations are changed because of that decision? Can I tell you that 50 bucks for a dinner would be well worth it? Let's begin to think this way for Christmas. Okay, let me give you a short message. That was all introduction. I just wanted to give you a little snip, snapshot of what we're doing and what we could do, okay? You, you got it? You got it? Yep. Psalm 112. The Bible says that good will come to those who are, say it out loud, yeah. generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Okay, this is a promise from God. Check out the next verse. Surely the righteous will, be, will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. Okay, God blesses us for a reason. He does not intend for us to keep all of the blessing for ourselves. But you get to live however you want to. You get to decide how you live. It's in your court. But there is a way that you can remain unshaken. Sean, is that true? My life can be unshaken? Yes. I can't stop the shaking around you in the world. But the Bible teaches that Jesus said, in the world you will have trouble, but take courage. I've overcome the world. There is a way that you can be unshaken while the world is shaking all around you. You can have a peace that makes your life panic proof. And, and the Bible teaches us how. Like you have to define what your life is about. Because if you don't define what your life is about, your problems will define it for you. Why are you here? What does your life mean? What are you going to do to make a difference? Because people without vision, they cast off restraint. Their life, they feel like it doesn't matter. I want your life to, I want you to know your life does matter. You can make a difference and your life will never make sense until you're connected to this purpose. And then the Bible says that a righteous person will be remembered forever. What's that? It's legacy. It's where your legacy has legs. When you're dead and gone, your legacy keeps on running. You're living beyond you. You need to know the thrill of what this feels like because legacy, it doesn't stop with you. There's a guy in the Bible named Moses. Everybody say Moses. Moses delivered a million and a half people from slavery. Pretty big deal. He passes his leadership on to a guy named Joshua. Say Joshua. Joshua was a good leader for a while, led the people into the promised land, and then he has this verse where he preaches. He says, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, as a pastor, I preach the heck out of that verse. 
Because I want all of our families to serve the Lord. Amen. Problem. The very next chapter lets us know after Joshua and his family, there arose an entirely new generation that did not know God nor the things of God. What in the world? Moses, million and a half people. Joshua led him in the promised land and his house serves God. And then it stops with him. Can I tell you, God does not want this legacy to stop with you. We must feel compelled. We must feel the urgency to pass this on to the next generation. I'm fifth generation pastor on both sides of my family. It's like the mafia. My great great grandpa planted 14 churches in South Dakota before church planning was even a thing. We have the newspaper clipping. Now, to me, we do a lot, but there's no greater joy for me than to see our girls now serving people, loving Jesus, loving the house, loving God. There are some people that take pictures of their kids playing soccer and video of them at the basketball game. I think that's magnificent. Keep doing that. I take pictures of my girls in worship. It's stalkerish. They're worshiping Jesus. I'm over here like, that, that's so cute. <laughs> Is that okay? I don't care. <laughs> I want to capture moments. There's nothing that thrills my heart more than the next generation getting it. Especially when a generation like this is supposed to be 4% Christian. We got to do something about this. Come on, are you feeling the urgency? We've got to get the message out. Legacy has to have legs. It's got to go beyond us. And most of us are only thinking about this earth. But there's something called eternity. And I want to help you as a pastor. It's my role to help you down here on earth as much as we can. Small groups, growth track, dream team, church. Okay. But, but I want to prepare you for heaven too. Romans chapter 14 says this. Let's go to Romans chapter 14. Why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Okay, look, look, look. This is judgment day. It's going to happen. And it's written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, that every knee will bow and every tongue will acknowledge God. And we need to know that it's extremely important that, that on that day, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Okay, okay look at me, everybody. Um, when, when that day comes, it's going to be really important that you're on the right team. Because it's going to happen. Whether people believe it or not, there will come a day. And on that day, we stand before God. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will step back and say, OMG, he really is God. I want to help you prepare for that. And, and, and if, there, if there's like a, a test um, that, that, that's coming, I'd like to give you the answers. How many hated tests in school? You hated tests? Hated them. Oh, the worst. You know what's the worst? Scantrons. The worst. Multiple choice, forget about it. Because you'd read A, and you'd be like, it's S-A. And then you read B, and you're like, hmm, it could be B. And then you read C, like, oh, man, C really sounds good. How many were like me? You were a fan of D, all the above. <laughs> and didn't you hate it when the teacher was like, okay, class, time's up, pencils down. I'd fill out abacadabba all the way down the scantron and hope for the best. Well, listen, I don't want to just give you the questions. I want to give you the answers because it's an open book test. I said it's an open book test. It's an open Bible test. God's not giving you just the questions. He's giving you the answers too. Here's the first question in review. What did you do with Jesus? That's going to be the first question that determines eternal life. What did you do with Jesus? Jesus came to pay for sin. We all deserve judgment and punishment. Jesus said, I don't want you to receive judgment and punishment. I'll pay for your sin because all sin needs to be paid for. Here's, here's the problem. Unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of people that pay for their own sin. Hell is not a place where God sends people he doesn't like. Hell is a place where people go to pay for their sins if they want to. My recommendation is don't pay for your own sins. Jesus already paid. Make him the Lord of your life. Receive that by faith and by grace. And you watch, you watch as your life is transformed. Okay, listen. We're all going to stand before God one day. When we get there, this is not relative. There's a right answer and there's some wrong answers. 
Truth is not relative. And we understand this in so many other places. Like two plus two is, it's not three, it's not 17, it's not 82. It always has been four, it always will be four, it's four. <laughs> Truth is not based on my feelings. Like if I went to my math teacher in ninth grade and said, you know what? I feel like I aced that test. And she's like, whatever, you got a 57%. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like I got an A. Doesn't matter how I felt, the truth said something else. If you're on a basketball team, Chicago Bulls, and they're like, hey, I feel like we won the game. Uh, no, you didn't. The Warriors beat you 198. <laughs> like, look, 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 look. Just because we feel something doesn't mean it's true. And I say that because a lot of people are confused. They're like, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. I'm not as bad as my friends. No, what, what? Where is that in the Bible? The Bible is very clear. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. This is not being arrogant. This is super helpful. This is super directional. Come on, anybody grateful Jesus wasn't vague on how to get to heaven? He's like, guys, come through me. I'll take care of your sin. I'll get you there. Now, we're going to stand before God one day. It doesn't need to be something you're afraid of. But in Revelation chapter 20, John says, I saw the great white throne. That's the judgment day. And him who's seated on the throne, that's Jesus. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were open. Somebody say books. books. Watch this. Another book. Say book. book. Say books. book. Say book. book. Say books. Book. Say book. book. Say books book. I love you. <laughs> Another book was open, which it was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what was the, according, done according in the books. Another book was open. We were judged according to what was in the books. Let me explain it this way. There's coming a day on Judgment Day where we stand before God and every sin that we've ever committed has been recorded in the books. When you stand before God one day, you are not going to be... You're not going to want to be judged based on what's in the books. You're going to want to be judged by what's in the books. So here's what Jesus does. Jesus comes and looks at all. He doesn't ignore the facts. He looks at all of our sin. And when you give your life to Jesus, he takes his eraser and erases every sin of every. And he turns around and writes your name in the book of life. So when the devil's talking to the angels like, hey, you shouldn't let Gene in. He did a lot of mess and sin down here. The angel's like, that's weird because I can't even find his name in the books. Oh, that's because his name is not in the books. It's in the Lamb's book of life. Come on, anybody grateful today? You wrote your name in the book of life. Today, I want you to know that you know that you know. And this is, this is, this is how we know how we get our name in the book. Because Matthew 7 says, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven on that day, but only those who do the will of my Father who's in heaven. There's going to be a lot of confusion on that day. A lot of people are like, hey, Lord, did we not? We did a lot of things in your name. Like we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We work miracles in your name. Like this is big stuff. And Jesus said, I'll tell them plainly, depart from me. I never knew you. See, Jesus is not interested in you having a religious mindset. He wants relationship with you personally. So how do we get our name in the book? It's relationship. What'd you do with Jesus? Um, I, I want you to know God for yourself. This is not going to be like, hey, I went to a building once a week and we talked about Jesus. I had a book that talked about Jesus. I posted on social media every once in a while a quote from the book about Jesus. All those answers don't get you into heaven. The right answer is, you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you followed him, and you accepted his grace and his mercy, and you made him Lord. Listen, Jesus paid for our sin. I was at a restaurant a long time ago, and I'm not this guy, but, but I forgot my wallet. Oh, so embarrassing. And, and so when the bill came around, I reached for it, and then I realized I don't have any means to pay. I did that once. Uh, do you know anybody who does that all the time? bill comes they turn around look at you like oh man oh man you got me bro you got you got me right you got i don't even know why they're patting their chest like they keep their wallet up here like where 
what? That's weird. You got me? You got me? Okay, listen. I couldn't have paid even though I wanted to. I did not have the means to pay. Thank God for my friend who reached across the table and said, don't even worry about it. I got the bill. Okay, look. You and I owed a debt of sin. We couldn't pay it even if we wanted to. But I have a strange feeling there's a few of us in the room that are grateful for Jesus who reached across the table and said, I'll pay the bill. That first judgment determines heaven or hell. The second judgment has nothing to do with heaven and hell. It has to do everything with rewards. So you're already in, but there's a second judgment, a second question. Here it is, and here's the answer. What would you do with what I gave you? First question, what'd you do with Jesus? That determines salvation. And then what'd you do with what I gave you? Like, to whom much is given, much is required, right? Well, I want you to know this, that once you get to heaven, Jesus wants to give out some rewards. And anything Jesus has given, you're gonna want, because he's a good gift giver. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things we did on earth. Here's another verse, Matthew chapter 16, Verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his holy angels. Watch this. And then he will, come on, anytime a preacher pauses in a verse, that's your time to shout out the word. Let's try it again. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and he will reward, reward each person according to what he's done. He wants to reward you, and God is he's giddy about this. He, he wants to pay you back. So he wants to reward you, but how you live matters. And when you realize that your life is not just for you, that God's blessing to bless through you, you realize before Jesus Christ, your entire life's mission was find Jesus. After you find Jesus, your entire life's mission now is to help other people find Jesus. You take your time, your talents, your resource, your energy, and you pump that into a church or a cause to help people find the Lord. Amen. How do we do this? Here, Psalm 112 tells us how. And just write this down if you're a note taker. I will intentionally give what I have. I will intentionally give what I have. It's not random. It's intentional. And by the way, I think it's important to note that, that God is not asking for something you don't have. He's only asking for what you do have. He's not asking for you to give on credit. That's called debt. The Bible is letting us know very clearly, if God blesses you, then be a blessing. If God gave you encouragement through somebody, turn around and encourage somebody else. If God gave you some wisdom, start a small group, then February, and teach some wisdom. Do what God's given you, you pass it on. If God's blessed you financially, we turn around and we pass it on. We bless others to be a blessing. We coach pastors because we were stuck for seven years with zero growth. Then God gave us some relationships with great churches and strategy, so now we help other churches. Why? Because God helped us. It's just being a blessing. It's paying it forward, but attaching the name of Jesus to it. Here's what's crazy. In the Wall Street Journal, oh, I think it's August the 31st, 2013, they came out with an article that said, um, it was entitled this, Hardwired for Giving. And they talked about how when you give, there's a chemical released in your brain that makes you feel good. <laughs> Who put that there? God did. Evolution didn't put that there. God did. Why? Because he wants to bless through you, and he wants you to feel good when you do it. You'd agree with this. Greedy people make the world worse. Yeah. Generous people make the world better. Yeah. Let's be generous. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 9, 11 says, you will be enriched in every way. Why? So that you can be generous on every occasion and through us. Somebody shout through us. Through us. Your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. It will result in people coming to know God. So God will provide for you. He will enrich you. And this is not the prosperity gospel. Somebody's like, oh, he's saying rich in church. No, listen, pay attention. A lot of people get mixed up with the prosperity gospel. That, that's false. That's wrong. They'll say, oh, God wants me rich so I can be rich. Not true. But all through the Bible, we see God does want to bless you with more so you could be a blessing to somebody else. So you could be generous on every occasion and that your generosity is actually resulting in people coming to God. Did you see that in the scriptures? Come on, help me out. Say yes. Okay, watch this. You need to know why God's blessing you. You need to know what the more is for. What's, what's it for? To be a blessing. Because you're blessed to bless. I said you're blessed to bless. 
I would suggest you become a percentage giver. What's that? Well, the Bible teaches us to give 10%. And actually, it's not even giving. It's returning because God says it's his. It's called a tithe. First 10%. I've been doing it since I was in sixth grade. First 10% always goes to God. It shows God you're first in this area. And God blesses us. Okay, watch this. We never tell you to give here. I, I feel uncomfortable doing that. I don't like churches that, that put pressure on people. We never tell you to give, but we will unapologetically tell you, pray, ask God what you should do above the tithe and give it. God says, start with 10%. By the way, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but we have a 90-day tithe challenge. What's that? Well, all through the Bible, God says, don't you test me. Don't you test me. One place in the Bible, Malachi 3, he says, test me. I wish you would. And see if I don't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing over you that you can't contain. And so we take that seriously here at Fellowship Church. We would encourage you to tithe for 90 days. It must be the first and it must be 10%. You do that to God. It's just returning it to him. And if you're not fully satisfied in 90 days that God has blessed you in some way, doesn't have to be money. It could be a money. It could be a job. It could be peace in your home. If there's not something you can put your finger on and say, God's blessed us since we've done this, we will give you your, all your money back from that 90 days. There's not a lot of churches offering a money back guarantee. Why would you do that, Sean? Because we believe God's word. Simple. And all the tithers in here, don't clap unless you've tithed, and this is true. This is not coerced. If you're a tither and you can testify, God has come through as, and provided for you as you've given him the first 10%, clap your hands and say a good amen. All right? Become a percentage giver. Know what the more is for. To put God first, to trust him in this area. And then I honestly think it's important to realize when you give, Ask some questions like, is it going to show up in heaven? Because there's a lot of great charities. They're doing great things. But are they attaching the name of Jesus to that, helping people get to heaven? I backed my, my giving back because we would give to different organizations. I backed it way back several years ago, and I said, I'm going to give to what makes a difference in heaven. I want my giving to show up in heaven. So treat us as a church. When you're giving to a church, you're not just giving to a church today. You're giving through a church. Treat us like the mutual fund guys. When I give to my mutual fund, I don't know what he invested in. I just trust he knows where it's going to go. Listen, we've done our research. We have, the, we have great, great partnerships with people locally, nationally, and internationally. If you want to return on investment in heaven, I believe we have some great play. If you want to see people come to, come to Christ in the, the smallest window of area that nobody else is going to, we found some people who are preaching gospel, the gospel there. If you want to preach the gospel in Africa, in Asia, South America, here in the States, we have some great places you can invest it in. So today, listen, you're giving. This will be the biggest offering that we take this, this whole year, and none of it's going to stick. We're passing it all on to these five lanes. Write this down. I will intentionally serve others. I'm going to give, but I'm also going to serve my time, my talents. Some of us have a dream to be great one day. It's not bad. It's not bad that you want to be great. Jesus just clearly defines what greatness looks like. He says this in Matthew 20. Whoever wants to become great must be a servant. Jesus, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Even Jesus, he's like, man, you want to be great? Great. But here's how you become great. Serve. So we'll help you do this. Go through our growth track. Get on our dream team and start to serve. Okay, listen, you ready for this? Our dream team consists of over 2,100 people who serve at this church. It's incredible. But I'm not satisfied until all 5,000 that come on a weekend are serving. Because listen, if all 5,000 are serving, we have more legs to stand on. We have more legs to expand. We have more gifts and more talents, and God can trust us with more. Can you imagine if everybody was serving in their gifts. And by the way, we don't want you serving in places you hate. If you hate kids, we don't want you in the nursery. We want you serving in your gifts. God has a... And when you step into serving with your gifts, watch me. You'll come alive. Because you realize, I'm making a difference for eternity. 
Write this last one down. I will intentionally share Christ. For the next two weeks, can we just shift our mindset where we are literally looking for opportunities to share Jesus Christ? Every job, every school, every store, every soccer game, the ballet recital, at the movies next week, Christmas services, 12 of them two weeks from now. This is your best chance of getting a yes all year long. Pay attention to these last couple of verses. We are Christ's ambassadors. That God is making his appeal through us. So we speak for Christ when we tell people, come back to God. You're his ambassador. You may not know it or recognize it. You represent Jesus. Wherever you go this week, you represent it. Here's another verse. Jesus is talking. He says, go out to the country lanes and, and out behind the hedges. This is where everybody would hang out. Urge anyone you can find to come. Read this out loud with me, everybody. Come on, both campuses. So that my house will be God wants his house to be full. And notice he didn't just say pray about it. Because a lot of people are like that. Lord, send them in. I'm just going to pray. Send them in from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Okay, you can pray, but he also said, go. Invite them. Compel them. Your neighbors, your friends, your family members, most of them will say yes if they're just invited. Last verse. First Timothy, Paul commands a pastor named Timothy to tell the church, command those who are rich in the present world. Which again, if I said rich, some of you are like, well, that's not me. I'm checking out. Nope. Remember, statistically, if you make $45,000 combined household income in America, you're in the top 1% of the world. Some of y'all are rich and don't even know it. He said, in this present world, listen, there's another world coming. He said, don't be arrogant and put your hope in your wealth. That's so uncertain. It's up and down. Put your hope in God. Who Watch this. Who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So again, God's going to bless you. It's okay. It's okay to enjoy what God gives you. Enjoy the car, the house, the vacation home, the boat. Enjoy it. Don't feel bad about it. He just said it doesn't stop there. There's part B. Then command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. Why? I'll, I'll tell you this. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves in heaven as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that's really life. Like, you want to know what life really feels like, what living really feels like? It's living a generous life, making a difference for eternity. You'd agree with this. The greatest people in the world seem to be miserable. The most generous people in the world seem to be blessed. Let's just make up our minds. God make us the most generous people on the planet. Let the cities recognize that church folks are the most generous people in the city. Filled with compassion, pointing people to hope and healing in Jesus. Come on, if you believe it, clap your hands and say a good amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Maybe you're here and you say, Sean, I haven't given my life to Christ, but I need to right here, right now. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. You say, that's me. Count me in this prayer. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior, put my faith in him. Or you were once close to God, but maybe you drifted away and it's just time to come back. On the count of three, could you lift up your hand and say, Sean, count me in that prayer when you pray it. Every campus here. One, two, three. Lift it up and just leave it up. Yes, 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 but it's my honor. By the way, everybody who gives here, thank you for making these moments possible because I've never been in a service where somebody didn't give their life to Christ. Would you pray this with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me right where I am. Today I give my life to you. Forgive me from my sin. Wash me clean. Be my Lord and Savior. And take all my gifts. Use them to reach others with your love. 